it up. Give it up for the Lord. Give it up for the Lord. Thank you all for tuning in this morning. And let us go to God in prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, God, for another day. Thank you, God, for keeping us, Lord. Thank you, God, for being a healer. Lord, thank you for being a deliverer. Thank you for being a way maker. God, you are worthy of all the honor. You're worthy of all the praise. You're worthy of all the glory. We thank you, Jesus, for making ways out of no ways. Glory to your name, God. You're worthy. Jesus, we thank you, God. Thank you for your blood covering. Thank you that your blood still works. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. You're worthy, Jesus. You're worthy, God. There's none like you, Jesus, in all the earth. If we had 10,000 tongues, we couldn't praise you enough. God, you are so worthy. And Lord, we just thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the Way Church of Tampa Bay. Thank you, God, for our pastor and his wife beside him. Thank you, Jesus, for our pastor Cole and his wife. Lord, we thank you, God, for all the leaders in the ministry. We thank you for every minister. We thank you for every elder, deacon. We thank you for all the visitors, God. And Lord God, we thank you for getting us through this pandemic thus far. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for healing our bodies. Thank you, Jesus, for keeping us and covering us and shielding us and protecting us. And God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus for those who are hurting right now, God. Those who need healing, God, by your stripes, they are healed in the name of Jesus. That's what your word says. And we believe in your word. We pray right now for Miss Alvira, for her healing, God. We pray for Sister Nicole Williams as she's going to have surgery, God. We pray for Sister Jacqueline Pinckney for her healing, God. We pray right now, God, that you will touch the doctors, touch the nurses, touch the PCTs, every person that will be working on them, God. I pray, God, that you will touch their hands, God, and let them go into their bodies and get what they need to get, God. And God, I pray, Lord, that you will have your way, Lord, and let your will be done, God in those people right now in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray for this service, Lord. I pray, God, that we will just hear a word from you. Let us worship in spirit and in truth, God. And Lord, I pray, God, that your spirit will be in the midst, God. We welcome you into the room, Holy Spirit. Have your way in this place, God. And we thank you, Jesus, and we love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Come on, let us adore God. Let's, let us continue to worship Him. Hallelujah, God. You're worthy. You're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. I want to encourage you to, as I do likewise, to begin to set your mind on Jesus this morning. Come on, we've already gotten dressed. We've jumped over a number of hurdles things are settled now we're in the house of the Lord and we've come not to see a man in the name of Pastor Keith but we came to see the one who's rescued all of us amen so begin to set your mind on Jesus hallelujah he is worthy to be praised hallelujah God, we set our minds on you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's worthy to be praised. You're worthy to be praised, God. God, we're in our right minds this morning because of you. Oh, God. We're here today because of you, God. Because of your goodness and your mercy, God. Because of your reckless love. Because you never sleep and you never slumber, oh God. Because your eyes are always upon the earth, oh God. That's why we're here this morning. Because you are who you are, God. Us with our inconsistent selves. 
our lukewarm selves, oh God. It's you who sustains us, God. And we worship you, oh God. We enter your gates with thanksgiving, oh God. We thank you, Lord. Come on, somebody tell them thank you. Only you know what he's done for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. Come on, it's a privilege to worship our God together. Let's invite him in this space. His presence is everywhere, but let's send an invitation. Let's give him a personal invite. God, we want you here this morning. We need you here this morning. There's some things that we won't pray aloud that only you know about, God. We need you this morning, God. We invite your presence in this place. We welcome it, God. Hallelujah. You are worthy to be praised. Oh, God, I love them. I love you this morning. Say that again. Hallelujah. You're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. You're worthy to be praised. Ooh, he's so worthy to be praised. Y'all help me say that. Hallelujah. You're worthy to be Hallelujah. You're worthy to be praised. Just one more time till the congregation gets it. Hallelujah. You're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're worthy to be Let's sing this next part together. I lift my hands. I lift my head and I praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. We bow our heads. I bow my head and we honor you, Lord. I honor you, Lord. I lift my hands. I lift my head. I praise you, Lord. And we bow our heads. I bow my head. I honor Hallelujah. you, Lord. Hallelujah. You're worthy to pray. Hallelujah. Come on, can y'all help us sing that part? Hallelujah. He is worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. One more time. Hallelujah. You're worthy to be just put your hands together if you believe that God is worthy to be praised. Whew. I don't know about you, but there's so much that I can worship him for. He's faithful. He's kind. He's long suffering. He's patient. God, we lift you up this morning. Truly, you are worthy to be praised. Let's go back to the top. Hallelujah. You're worthy to to be exalted hallelujah
and we bow our heads. I bow my head. We honor you, Lord. I honor you, Lord. We lift our hands. I lift my head. We praise you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. We bow our heads. I bow my head. I honor you, Lord. Hallelujah, you're worthy. Hallelujah, you're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah, you're worthy to be praised. Hallelujah, you're worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we lift you up. Hallelujah. You're worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So worthy. God, we lift you up. Hallelujah. Lord, we lift you up. Hallelujah. You're worthy. Come on. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. We praise your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we lift you up. Come on, do y'all believe he's worthy? Come on, some of us will celebrate our spouses more than we'll celebrate God. He's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be lifted up. Come on, hundreds of thousands of people just died in 2020, but yet we're here still giving his name glory because he's worthy. you up this morning right where you belong God we thank you that your kingdom has no end God because truly you're worthy to be praised hallelujah I, I want to share something with you all my, my heart is heavy this morning in a good way I want to share something with you all um, I just shared with the praise team before we minister this next song I had an opportunity to uh, go back home and visit some family yesterday in my hometown and my husband and I were talking about some trauma I experienced as a child and uh, many of you know I've said it publicly across the pulpit and um, one of the testimonies I say one of because God has done so much in my life but one of the testimonies uh, was that I was molested as a child <clears throat> by a cousin and an uncle we were cutting through a neighborhood and I wanted to show my husband not only my place of trauma, kind of a turning point in my life, um, but I was more concerned to show him where I had been rescued 
David said it was good that I was afflicted for therein I saw the Lord and I'm not glorifying the trauma but what I'm saying is sometimes we can look at certain places where it just seemed like our life went left where maybe we lost a loved one where someone gave up on us someone um we became the victim because of someone else's sin but I was so grateful that I was able to return back and look at it as a place where God rescued me we were probably driving through there. Amen. That's worthy of a hand clap. Not for me, but because of God. He's faithful. I was telling Pastor Keith while we were driving in the car, looking at that apartment just gave my heart so much joy because I don't even know how I made it out in those circumstances. I don't know. For a little girl in my circumstances growing up in that neighborhood there's no counselors on board there's no no all kind of these different resources that we now have in place I just had to depend on God I'm so grateful for a praying grandmother who left me nothing in her will because she didn't have anything to live, leave but left me Jesus She left me Jesus. She left me a prayer life. She left me hope. Jesus said that in this life you'll face many trials, many troubles. He never promised that it will be a clean slate. And sometimes I think our theology is off in the body of Christ at large because we tell people, come to Jesus and everything will be okay. But we need to let them know that no, yes, it'll be okay in the end, but you may still have to endure a lot of things still have to get through some t difficult relationships still have to face some trials may still have some thorns in our side god is good he's rescued my life i was thinking about this song that we were ministering and <clears throat> my encouragement to you why am i saying this what's in my mind as i'm ministering this song is that little pink apartment way tucked away in a ditch on beach avenue that nobody knows about so i encourage you to get on your mind where is the place that God rescued you? Turning point. God is faithful. None of us deserve his love, but yet he gives it freely. We don't even love how he loves. We put conditions on people. I love Pastor Keith. He's a good husband to me, but it's nothing like the love of God. Come on, let's set our minds on God. Can you all stand to your feet and worship God? You all know I'm just an interim praise and worship leader, so I don't, I don't like having to give commands to say worship God. It's just, it's our reasonable service. He's been good to us. It wasn't Pastor Keith loving on me. It was God who rescued me, who kept my mind. just so thankful God this morning I'm just so thankful you've rescued my life this morning and with every opportunity I have oh God it's a privilege to tell you thank you God it's a privilege to give you honor oh God because you're worthy of it oh God I thank you for saving the, the, the seven-year-old girl in the apartment, oh God. I thank you that when nobody knew my name, oh God, you knew me and you knew the hairs on my head, oh God. I thank you, oh God, for the things that I've never shared across the pulpit, but you know about it, oh God. We worship you this morning because that's just my testimony, but you can be in all places at all times, oh God. So every person sitting in a seat this morning, you've rescued their lives, oh God. We're not here on our own accord, oh God, for your word tells us that it's you who enables us both to will and act according to your perfect will, oh God. So it's you who gives us the desire, oh God. It's you who rescues us, oh God. It's you who establishes our feet, oh God. It's you who sets us on our going, oh God. You are worthy to be praised this morning, oh God. And we won't enter into your house this morning as usual. Oh God. my life I owe him my life we owe you our lives God we owe you our lives oh God every one of us should have a tombstone right now in somebody's gravesite I owe you my life God come on church he's worthy 
He's worthy. Don't let clothes, don't let the person next to you. Don't even let your mind and your circumstance now cause you to forget how good God has been. He's been good to us. He cleans us up to the point where nobody knows what we've been through or even what we're going through. Woo. I don't know about you, but it's easy for me to say hallelujah. It's easy for me to say thank you, Jesus. Woo. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah, God. You are the righteous king. You are our redeemer, oh God. You are the lifter of our head, oh God. You are the one that rescues us, oh God. You're the one that continues to rescue us, oh God. That even when we said, for God I live and for God I die, we still turned our backs on you, oh God, but you've been faithful. Oh God. Oh, I love him. Oh, I love you this morning. You have rescued my life. You've changed my speech. You give me grace to endure. You give me strength to hope for tomorrow. I owe you my life, God. Oh. It's a hard journey he calls us to. It's a hard thing he calls us to. But it's a good thing. And we worship you this morning because you've rescued us. You've rescued us. The Bible says he transfers us from the domain of darkness from the domain that's a kingdom from the domain of darkness and into his marvelous light our thinking is dark our ways are dark our intentions are dark our heart is wicked and he transfers us from the domain of darkness not because of our good behavior not because of our pedigree not because of any degrees we've earned but just because he loves us oh have rescued my life God he's rescued us you have rescued my life you have rescued my life you have rescued my life God, and I'm never going back. I have nothing to return to. I don't want the old ways of thinking. I don't want the old ways of treating people any kind of way. You've been too good to me for me not to be gracious to people, to not be long suffering. My heart is full this burden because he's rescued us and when someone saves your life you shouldn't get up acting the same I don't know about you but I've been in some car accidents that were near death if you ever see me limping my left leg was crushed in the car I broke my femur bone because I was hit head on and you get up with a different perspective he rescues you you should get up with a different perspective a different perspective you have rescued my life you have rescued my life and I'm never going back can y'all help me sing Say so you've rescued my life. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And I'm never going back. And I'm never going. Come on, let's just stay right here and continue to minister this. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. You have rescued. 
rescued my life. You have rescued my life. And we're never going back. And I'm never going back. Come on, you have rescued my life. I pray this gets down in your spirit. Don't leave out of church the same way this morning, saints. He's rescued us. He could have rescued anybody. We still know people who need to be rescued. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful this morning. You have rescued my life, God. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. Never going back. And I'm That's why I live how I live. That's how, why I forgive how I forgive. Because he's rescued me. Nobody in here rescued me. No counselor, no doctor, no parent, no spouse. And here's our response when he rescues us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're my, you're my redeemer. So we say hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's a very simple response. It's my response. My response. God is hallelujah this morning. Hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give you a minute to just worship God. Father, we've spoken the words in the atmosphere. You've rescued our lives. Because of it, we owe you our lives. Our response is the highest praise we can give you. Say you have. You have rescued my life. You have rescued my life. Psalms 25 and 1 says, Unto you, Lord, do I submit my soul. There's nothing to go back to. There's nothing to return to. We've already submitted ourselves to him. We have to live like we've submitted ourselves to him. If we can't think of a reason to worship God, At very least, I pray this morning that we remember that we've been rescued by him. And when someone rescues you, the least you can do is be appreciative. One of the things that I love about God is how the Bible describes him as a gentle redeemer. He restores with grace. Doesn't blast us on front street. Doesn't explore our inconsistencies. (laughs) Doesn't reveal our wicked thoughts and our devilish ways. He just receives us over and over again. Over and over. He's so gracious. We cut people off in a heartbeat. 
disconnect ourselves for the sense of saying we're putting boundaries in place but yet he's gracious I'll sing your praise I'll sing your praise Hallelujah. Let's go to God in prayer. My intentions is not to talk about my own life and use this as an opportunity, but I share in hopes that someone is encouraged. I don't know any other way but to be up here is just to love on God. I love to love on God. Love to worship Him. So I pray this morning that you also had an opportunity to love on God. to our rescue. We love you this morning. Nobody knows. We can tell each other. We can sit here all day, God, telling one another what you did, and we still will probably miss something because you knew us before you formed us. You knew the circumstances we would be born into. You know the hiccups in life we would face. And you chose to rescue us, and we love you for that this morning. We pray that you were glorified in our worship. We pray that you touch our minds and our hearts, oh God, continually, even after this morning. May we always be submitted to you. May we always live, speak, and act in a way that's reflective of the fact that we know we've been rescued by you. You are a personal God, for your word tells us that we have not a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us, but one who has been tempted in every way that we have. So you know us personally. You're involved. You understand. And we thank you for that. That even when this gets difficult, we know you didn't just rescue us and leave us, but we know you know what it feels like to endure in this race. We thank you this morning we thank you for your precious Holy Spirit that you didn't leave us empty handed that leads and guides us into all truth you said it yourself Jesus that when the comforter comes that it will lead it will speak not on its own accord but it will only speak that which the Father says so we thank you that we have something on the inside of us oh God that speaks to us we love you this morning we absolutely love you we pray in the name of Jesus that you will rest your hand upon Pastor Keith that as he delivers the word that it would touch our not just our minds but our souls that it would take root and that it will bear good fruit that his labor will not be in vain that we won't sit come and eat only to throw it up as soon as we walk out of the door but we would digest it last it to Allow it to strengthen our bodies as good food does. Our spiritual bodies, God. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, God is good. Thank you all this morning. You may have your seats. Thank you all so much for worshiping with us. And to our online viewers, we thank you also for tuning in this morning. Uh, it's a privilege to be in the house of the Lord. It's a privilege to be in the house of the Lord. So we greet you again for those of you who missed the welcome that Minister Densho um, gave. We want to encourage you for those of you who are tuned in to continue to be involved, even while you worship with us virtually. Um, you can comment in the comment section, like, share, tell somebody that the word of the Lord is now getting ready to take place. Pastor Keith has been in this sermon series, set your house in order. And I don't know about you, but I thought I was in order, but it seems like I'm not. So I'm learning to put some more things in order. Not that I thought I arrived, but I thought I was doing okay until he started preaching and the word began to convict my heart. And so let us receive Pastor Keith now as he continues in the sermon series, set your house in order. Amen.
Hallelujah. We bless your name today. We bless your name today. I don't know about anybody else, but if you've ever witnessed anybody be rescued in the natural, there's a response. I think this song was so critical, but if you've ever seen someone rescued in the natural, somebody say there's a response. For those of us who've been watching the news and what happened in, in South Florida with the condo that collapsed, I witnessed a young man being pulled from the rubble, about 14 years old, and his response was tears of adoration because he had been rescued. Somebody say rescue. And I feel like if we really understood what the Lord had rescued us from, we wouldn't have to pull teeth to get a worship out. So watch this. This isn't for me, but this is for God. If we could just stand to our feet and watch this, not, not with the clapping of your hands, but with the fruit of your lips can you begin to thank God father we bless you God we're sorry for not giving you the adoration that you deserve God you rescued us God when no one was there so God for that we say thank you come on lift up something to him we bless your name on this morning we bless your name on this morning we bless your name on this morning father you rescued us and for that God we say thank you we bless your name. We bless your name. You rescued us. You rescued us. You rescued us. You rescued us. And God, for that, we say thank you. Thank you, God. We bless your name. We bless your name. And here's the other thing about being rescued. When you know God has rescued you from something that killed somebody else. When I think about that young man and that he was pulled from the rubble and the, the death count is still going up. And he was crying uncontrollably because he had been rescued, but watch this. He had been rescued from something that killed somebody else. So I don't know about y'all, I was in some situations that killed somebody else, but he rescued me. And for that, God, we say thank you. Give God a hand clap of praise because he rescued you. We can't tell you thank you enough. So for those of, who, of you who are in the house of the Lord, I'm grateful to see many of your faces on this morning. Your faces are evident that the Lord rescued you. In a year where many people lost their lives, God yet rescued us. And for that, we say thank you. I want us to take up our Bibles and I want us to go to the Old Testament book of the Bible to Isaiah chapter 38. Isaiah chapter 38. As my wife declared, I've been on a sermon series called Set Your House in Order. For many of us, we didn't know we were living in disorder until the Lord had to declare to us to set our houses in order. And I talked about our desire for order. I said that we have to have this level of desire for order. Then I said that we also, we've, we've got to understand God designed for order. Somebody say we need instructions. It's one thing to have the, the intent to set our houses in order, but without instructions, that order is in vain. And this morning, I want to talk about the doctrine of order. I want us to look at Isaiah chapter 38, verses 1 through 6. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. If you don't have your Bibles, it should be on your screen. The Bible said, in those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die and not live. Verse number two says, then King Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. 
and said, remember now, O Lord, I pray how I have worked before you in truth and with the Lord your heart and have done what is good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Verse number four declares, and the word of the Lord came to Isaiah saying, go and tell Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayers. Somebody say he was rescued. I have seen your tears. Surely I will add to your days 15 years and I will deliver you from this and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria and I will defend this city. The Bible says in verse number one in, the, in those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, said to him, set and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order for you shall die and not live. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to minister from this subject of, as I said, the doctrine of order. And, and here's why the doctrine of order is so significant. Because when God tells us to do something, he also has intentions of teaching us something. Uh, tell your neighbor, the Lord wants to teach me something. And it is no different with the instructions that we have for us to set our house in, the, in order. He also has intentions to teach us something. It's one thing for God to give us instructions and say, set our houses in order. But in the midst of all of that, God wants to teach us something. And there, there is a doctrine of order. And this word doctrine, I, don't, I want us to understand this, in both the Hebrew and the Greek, it simply means teaching, uh, teaching. So in other words, like I said before, God wants to teach us something. Therefore, when the Lord admonishes us to set some area in our life in order, the critical question that we've got to ask ourselves is what is the Lord trying to teach us? Whenever the Lord gives us a commandment to set our houses in order, the first question should come to mind, God, what are you trying to teach me as a result of this? God, what are you trying to enlighten my eyes to as a result of setting my house in order? Because whenever the Lord is leading us to order, there's also something that the Lord wants us to learn from order. Whenever God is leading us to order, there's something that God wants us to learn from order. And here's the problem. Here's one of the problems with many believers and not just with order. We want the leading of the Lord, but many of us are not open to learning from that leading. Many of us want God to lead us, but we don't want to learn any lessons in the midst of that leading. Tell your neighbor you've got to learn something. So, so, so God is saying, I, although I want you to set your house in order, I want you to learn something. Somebody may be asking, what do I mean? The Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So there are times, watch this, when the Lord will lead us into pain, but we don't want to be taught that way. He will lead us into pain, but we don't want to be taught that way. There are times where the Lord will lead us into persecution, but we don't like to learn that way. And the Lord will even lead us into the process of order. But many of us declare that God, I don't want to be taught that way. And here's a word of wisdom. Whenever the Lord leads us into something, he wants us to learn something. So watch this. We've got to be careful when we declare, teach me, Lord. Many of us have declared, God, teach me something in the midst of this. And watch, when you say, teach me something, God will, will um, show enough, cause you to learn something if you're willing to endure. Somebody say, the process. The process. So y'all love to declare, Lord, teach me something. Oh, he going to teach you all right. Because when you declare that not, not only do you agree, but watch this, to his message, but you also agree to his method. Did y'all hear what I just said? Whenever I declare, Lord, teach me, I'm not only agreeing to the message, what God wants to teach me, but I'm also saying I agree to your method. And many of us watch this. The reason why we don't learn a lot of stuff in, through the trials of life, because we like the message, but we don't like the method. Somebody say his ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. Matter of fact, they're higher than yours. So that means if you ask the Lord to establish order in our lives, we have to also watch this, be open to how the Lord wants to teach us by way of order. Because there's a doctrine of order. And this is why I believe we find King Hezekiah in our foundational text. During the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign over Judah, we find the Lord admonishing him to set his house in order. 
But here's the interesting thing to note. After 14 years of reigning as king, in the midst of his reign, God says, set your house in order. And the critical thing that, that I struggle with concerning King Hezekiah is that the Bible declares that Hezekiah was righteous in the eyes of the Lord. That's 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 3. And not only that, the Bible says that King Hezekiah removed the idols from the land. So, so not only was King Hezekiah righteous, not only did King Hezekiah remove the idols from the land, the Bible says that he also revered the Lord. That's 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 5. So, so watch this. Even though you may feel like you're right with God, there's still some areas in your life that you've got to set in order. My wife declared it over the pulpit. Sometimes you think you've been walking with God for a few years and you think, I got everything together. But even in the midst of all of that, the Lord says, Hezekiah, I need you to set your house in order. Even when he was righteous, even when he removed the idols, even when he revered the Lord, the Lord said, set your house in order. Because despite all that was right concerning Hezekiah, that was, there was, watch this, more that the Lord wants to reveal. Here's what I got to understand in this journey. There's always more that God wants to reveal to us. And many times the method in which God wants to reveal things unto us is by way, somebody say, of order. So as God told Hezekiah to set his house in order, I believe there were some things that the Lord wanted to reveal to Hezekiah. You are never too right with God to be beyond the revealing of God. There's always more that the Lord wants to reveal to you. There's always more that you need to learn from the Lord. And there's always more that the Lord wants to teach you. And this is why we must understand the doctrine of order. So this morning, I want us to understand what the Lord wants to teach us as we set our houses in order. So here's what I want to do. I want us to just examine the text. I want us to look at verse number one. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, in those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order. I don't care how long you've been a Christian until you get the glory. There will always be a need for you to be corrected. Did y'all hear what I just said? I don't care how long you've been a Christian in this journey until you get the glory. Somebody say, until I get the glory, I'm going to need to be corrected. Oh, somebody say, that's the pastor too. And this is why order comes to correct us. And somebody may be saying why. Because the fall of man in the garden broke God's perfect order for all men. And since the fall, God's redemptive plan involved reestablishing his perfect order. Y'all got to stay with me. So when the Lord admonishes us to set our houses in order, watch this. It's his attempt to restore what the fall of man ruined. So God is saying the reason that I've got to bring order in your life is because I'm trying to correct some areas that Adam and Eve broke. Somebody say, I've got to be corrected. Uh, so, so in other words, uh, corrected. And the reason why many believers, watch this, don't want order in their lives is because many of us don't want to be corrected. Y'all don't like that. So no, long, no matter how long you've been saved, there's still more sanctifying to be done. No, no, no matter how... Watch this, how well you can preach. I know Bishop T.D. Jakes called you, but there's still some more purifying to be done. Oh, I still got to be corrected. And no matter what the fact, watch this, I don't care if you've been called. There's still some cleansing that needs to be done. Oh, I tell you, neighbor, I need to be corrected. And despite what you may believe, everything that you think you do right ain't always right with God. Did y'all hear what I, what I said? Everything that we think we do right ain't always right with God. And that's why order comes to corrupt. See, some of y'all got jacked up lives out of, out of order because you do not want to be corrected. What am I trying to say? What your mama told you ain't always right. What your man told you ain't always right. Watch this. And I know, watch this. I know I'm the pastor. But there were some things that I told my, to my wife that was not always right. So there's times where God has to say, Pastor Keith, I need you to set your house in order so he might correct what I thought was right. And what you've justified in your mind ain't always right. We need to be corrected. We need the Lord's order. 
So in other words, here's what God is trying to teach us when he says set our houses in order. We need to be taught what's right in the Lord's eyes. So, so anytime God says that I want you to set your house in order, there's something in your life that is not right in my eyes. So it's good when God says set your house in order. And for those of us who were not here for the first uh, 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 sermon in this series, the reason why this is so critical and the reason that I want to make sure every area in my life is in a place of order is because I said order pleases God. And here's what I said about order as well. Order is the purpose of God. So watch this. You can never walk in or in purpose if you're not walking in order. So we got a lot of folk that can sing. We got a lot of folk that can preach. We got a lot of um, a gifted folk up here, but still walking in disorder. And God is not pleased. And we think that we're walking in our purpose, but our life is not full of order. And here's the other thing that I said. The reason why I want to make sure that I'm right in the eyes of God. I said that order preserves. So if, you, if there's anything in your life that you want God to preserve, you got to have order. And I said this, I know y'all may not like this. The reason why some marriages fail and were not preserved because there was no order. The reason why you could have the most anointed preacher, pastor, y'all can have the most beautiful edifice. And the reason why it fell, because somewhere, somewhere in the dark, there was disorder. And God says, watch this, I'm obligated to preserve that which is in order. Oh, that's good news to me. Anything you want preserved, tell your neighbor, get it in order. So, so this is why the Lord even told Hezekiah in our foundational text, set your house in order. Because we will always need correcting until the Lord calls us home. That, that's going to help somebody. So for some prideful folk, you're going to always need correcting until God calls you home. So stop getting so offended when somebody corrects you. Folk leave churches because they get corrected. And here's the good news. If I could just recognize that until I get the glory, that I'm always going to need to be corrected, I wouldn't run out of every church. Some of y'all done, y'all, done, y'all done lost best friends because you ain't want to be corrected. And the Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Who yeah. tell you, neighbor, I need to be corrected. So, so some of us may not like this, but your life is out of order and is raggedy because you do not like to be, I'm closing my eyes, rebuked. Did y'all hear what I just said? Some of our lives are out of order and simply, somebody say raggedy. Because we don't like to be rebuked. Oh, we need to be open to rebuke. And this is why, watch this. I believe it's on our screens. Proverbs 15, verse 32. The Bible says, he who disdains instruction despises his own soul. But he who heeds rebuke, somebody said, gets understanding. Oh, this is why order comes to correct in our lives. And what God in his word, watch this, deem as wrong. Whenever God says, I need you to set your house in order, there's something in my life, watch this, that God's word deems is wrong, or either God deems is wrong. I need y'all to stay focused. I know the baby's walking around, but somebody say, stay focused. Stay focused. Ah, so, so that means if we want order in our lives, watch this, then we must be open to rebuke. Listen, I've, done, I, I've been pastoring for a little while, and I noticed folk that have come to the church don't like to be rebuked. And many of us watch this because we have a construed, a uh, uh, distorted view of what rebuke comes to do. Because people watch this, they, they, they used it as a punitive measure. In other words, a, a, a tool of judgment. And God says the reason and the tool that I'm going to use, watch this, to correct you and get you back in line with my will, somebody say, is rebuke. Oh, Lord, we got to be the old church used to rebuke you. Watch this during the morning worship. See this contemporary church. We're going to take you in the back room. We're going to shut the door. You know, you got pastors now that signing. Um, what's them thing? Non-disclosure things. Lord, what happened to the pastors that will rebuke you? Somebody say openly. Oh, and watch this. The Bible says that open rebuke is better than secret love. I'm okay. And I said this earlier, I'm not so prideful that I won't allow my assistant pastor to rebuke me. And we've got this negative connotation of what rebuke is. And somebody say, all it is is correction. 
God is just saying, I want to correct you and get you back in line. Watch this with my will, my word and my way. Oh, because rebuke is a tool of God to establish order. So here's the good news. If you're in a period of your life where you seem like rebuke is coming from every which way, that's good news. Somebody say that's good news. Because what God is saying is that there's some area in your life that I'm trying to correct. Oh, that's good news to me, y'all. Oh, that's good news. I don't want to think I got everything together. So the critical question we got to ask ourselves is how do we respond to rebuke? Do we reject rebuke or do we receive rebuke? Because when someone calls us out and corrects us because we're living contrary to God and his word. I don't know about nobody else. I know we got some visitors this morning, but this is for the way church. I, some folk that we had to come sit down with and talk to, I need y'all say, tell this, um, say this out loud, be open to rebuke. Because listen, if y'all don't know me by now as a pastor, I'm not trying to be punitive in my development of you. All I'm trying to do is get you back in line with the will and the word of God. I don't know about nobody else's church, but somebody say, this church, this church. will rebuke you. Okay, I hope y'all heard that. If you don't want to be rebuked, leave the church. Y'all don't hear too many folks say that. Somebody say, leave the church. Ah, because watch this, your inability to receive rebuke, watch this, will determine your inability to receive order in your life. Your inability to receive rebuke, watch this, will determine your inability to receive order in your life. And the reason we blame it on so much stuff, God, I ain't got the resources. God, they don't like me over there. God, you know how hard my life done been. And really God is saying, I've produced rebuke in your life and you rejected it. So some of us are out of order in our lives, not because God don't like us, because we don't like, somebody say, rebuke. rebuke. And hear this, uh, here's a word of wisdom, because somebody's saying, Pastor Keith, you better get one of your ministers, stay with me. Everyone is not eligible to rebuke. Watch this, that means everyone does not have a right to correct you. Somebody may be saying, how do I know? Watch this. Remember, rebuke is intended to correct living that is contrary to God and his word. Watch this. So if they do not correct you according to his word, don't receive it. And you got a lot of folk that want to correct you. Watch this without the word. If you ain't coming with the word, baby, don't come to me. Watch this. This is why the New Living Translation of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. I believe it's on our screen. Notice what the Bible says. All scripture, somebody say all scripture, all. is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and make us realize that what is wrong in our lives. Oh, I don't care how your mama did it. If it ain't got the word, don't bring it to me. Yeah. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us what to do on what is right. That means don't let nobody try to correct you concerning the will of God if they're not willing to do it with the word of God. Yeah. Because why? how do I know? Many of us, and I said this, that we grew up in homes where we thought this was the way to do it. And we had no word to back up how we were living in our homes. You've got churches that operate, watch this, out of religious traditions. Because my bishop did it this way, and y'all know how anointed my bishop was, but it was not in the word. I don't have folk correcting you when they ain't giving you no word. You, we done told folk that they need to cover up and we ain't give them no word. And you wonder why they leave the church. We got folk that say you shacking up and we don't give them no word to back that up. Yeah. Oh, stand with me. Yeah. So don't let folk correct you if they have no word. This is why whenever I counsel somebody, I always make sure I leave them with a word. Because if you don't leave them with a word, watch this, you're going to leave them with some level of, watch this, somebody say hurt. And this is why many churches have abused people and hurt people because we think that we're so anointed and, and we've been walking with God so I can rebuke you in any kind of way that I want. And we left them hurt because there was somebody say no word. No word. Oh, Jesus. It, it, wasn't your, it wasn't your regalia and all that stuff you got on. I don't care about the cross and the little hat you got on. Somebody say, give me the word. Oh, I don't need your thoughts on the matter. I don't need your traditions on the matter. I don't even need your, watch this, y'all ain't gonna like this, your testimony on the matter if it's not rooted in God's word on the matter. 
Because many folk think because this is my experience, this is how it happened to me. But if there's no word concerning that on that testimony, tell your neighbor, I don't want it. Okay, that's from Pastor Keith. You can, you can accept some rebuke if you want to. I don't want it. Because his word is profitable. Watch this. Not your personal opinions. If it's going to profit, my life is not your personal opinions. It's his word. Somebody say it's his word. So whenever God says, I need you to set your house in order. Order comes to teach us. Watch this. To correct us from what is contrary to the Lord and his word. So the first thing that God always wants us to learn when he says set your house in order. He's trying to correct us. Somebody say correct us. Correct. Now let's look at the latter portion of verse number one. The Bible says, for you shall die and not live. Here's what I need us to understand. A byproduct of disorder is always a burden. A byproduct of disorder is always a burden. Here's what I'm trying to say. That means some of the burdens that we carry, watch this, are simply consequences of our disorder. Many times we think it's the devil, tell your neighbor it's disorder. So a lot of the burdens in our lives is not some, um, so, not some imp that the enemy has sent, not some device that the enemy has sent. Somebody say, it's my disorder. Because disorder, watch this, burdens are always a byproduct of disorder. Uh, so watch this, that for many, the debt, the disease, and even the divorce was not the devil. It was our disorder. Burdens that were byproducts of our disorder. And hear this, this is why order comes to teach us that there are consequences to disorder. So the next lesson that God wants us to learn, somebody say there's consequences. Because watch this, when correction does not produce order, many times God will use consequences. See, we don't like that. Many of us have ran out of churches that rebuked us or tried to correct us. And many times we found ourselves tangled up in a web what, way much deeper than when we were in the church. Because what God was saying, if I did, if you're not going to respond to correction, I'm going to give you some consequences. Oh, somebody say, I don't need to learn like that. So we've got to respond to correction. Uh, God will many times use consequences. And if we can be honest with ourselves, some of us don't like to listen to, to correction. So God will make us learn by way of consequences. And notice why, this is why the prophet told Hezekiah in our foundational text, for you shall die and not live. Consider the magnitude of this consequence. You shall die. With the, why, why such a heavy burden? Especially when believers are promised eternal life. We find that in John 4, 14. Especially when believers are promised with life and that more abundantly. We find that in John 10, 10. And even when believers are promised with the newness in life. That's Romans 6 and 4. Yet it is promised here that Hezekiah would die. What am I trying to say? When we fail to set our houses in order, one of our consequences is that we miss out on the promises of God. Do y'all see that? The Bible says that we're called to have eternal life, to have life and life more abundantly. And many of us, even a newness in life, and many of us get saved and we think that God is going to begin to open up the window of heaven and pour us out a blessing that we don't have room enough to receive. But watch this, you don't have room to receive what God has for you if you're still, watch this, in a place of disorder. Because, and I said this in one of my initial sermons, God never will bless disorder. And the reason why many of the promises, even though the Bible says that the promises of God are yes and amen, God is not going to waste his promises on somebody that's going to waste his promises. Did y'all hear what I just said? So God says, I don't care about all of this in your life. If there's no level of order, you're going to miss out on some of the promises of God. Oh, that's a sad tragedy. Why? Because the Lord will teach us with consequences. Watch this when we are unwilling to learn with correction. Uh, tell your neighbor, you don't have to learn the hard way. This is why, watch this, the beginning portion of Proverbs 19, 29 declares this. I believe it's on our screen. Notice what this text says. Judgments, somebody say consequences, are prepared for scoffers. In other words, consequences are prepared for those that are unwilling to conform to the Lord's order by way of correction. 
oh, I don't know if y'all see this, but the Bible says that they're prepared for me. That God says, if you don't do what I need you to do, there's some consequences that I'm going to prepare for your life. And many of us think that we're going through a season of drought. Many of us are praying to God to get us out of situations. But could it be that they had been prepared by God because we failed to have order in our lives? And remember, this is why one of the critical questions I said we got to ask ourselves when God says to set our houses in order, God, what are you trying to teach me? Because many of us, watch this, put the blame on, and it's misplaced blame. And we never look at ourselves. And God says, because you scoffed at my correction, I've prepared some consequences. Oh, that's a sad tragedy, y'all. I don't need God preparing no, that kind of stuff for me. Whew. Hey, watch this. That means God ain't playing with us about his order. And this is why he has prepared consequences for those that are willing to operate in disorder. So hear this, there are burdens that we prepare for ourselves because we fail to have order. And here's a word of wisdom. Galatians 6 and 2 admonishes all believers to carry one another's burdens. But I want to help lift some burdens this morning. We're not called to carry another's burdens that they prepared for themselves. Somebody say, because of this order. Watch this. Because we love, oh, I heard this one time, and I think this is, somebody say, this is out of order. Now, that may, that may be their assignment, but I heard somebody say that they've been given um, a lifeguard ministry for their children. Somebody say, the devil is a lie. So whenever they find themselves in trouble, they're called to go jump in and save them. And I'm not going to do that. Because why? Why? Why am I saying this? Because we may be called to correct them, but let God prepare their consequences. Don't watch this. Many of us waste our efforts, waste our energy, and watch this, even waste our emotions with folk that have prepared their own consequences. I'm not going to be praying for you on my prayer list and you have no desire to set your house in order. And watch this. Here's what gets us in trouble. Many of us think that we're obligated because we're in relationship. So, 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 so I think that I should invest my energy, my efforts, and my emotions because I'm in relationship. But watch this. Even you can be out of order trying to save folk that are in disorder. All, all God may be telling you to do is correct them. Because watch this, they ain't going to listen to you no ways. Watch this, how long have you been counseling them? How long have you given them the word? How long have you been long suffering with them? And watch this, they still like, I'm going to get back in this mess. I'm going to dibble and dabble in this mess. Stop wasting your energy and watch this, let God prepare some consequences. Ooh, I'm going to start wasting my energy, y'all. I'm a young man and I learned that I heard some folks say they 50 and free. No, I'm 30 something free. Because if not for the Lord, watch this, the Lord will teach us by way of, of consequences. Somebody say, set your house in order. I don't want to learn the hard way. So notice this and I'm going to be out your way. Let's look at verses 2 and 3. The Bible says, then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord and said, remember now, O Lord, I pray how I've walked before you in truth and with the law of your heart, and have done what is good in your sight. Watch this. The correcting of the Lord should always lead us to the counsel of the Lord. When God says, I need you to set your house in order, he's trying to teach us how to seek his face. Somebody say, seek his face. Uh, because, watch this. I made mention of this last week. But, but our ability to set our houses in order is dependent upon our willingness to seek his face. You'll never really be able to set your house in order if you don't seek his face. And the reason why some of y'all houses still jacked up is because you do not have a line of communication with the father of order. Somebody say, I got to seek his face. And watch this. This ain't something you can pray for somebody else. Somebody got to pray for them their own selves. That's why y'all got to get out of some folk business and let God prepare some consequences. Ah, because watch this. Notice the response of Hezekiah after being corrected. 
Oh, y'all, we see this in the life of David after Nathan corrected him. But we, whenever there was a man that was wise or a woman of God that was wise after correction, notice what they do. You can read it throughout the Bible. Uh, look at verse number two. The Bible says, then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord. In other words, Hezekiah sought the counsel of the Lord. So the question is, what do you do when the Lord corrects you by way of order? What, what is my response when God corrects me? How many of us, we, we love to cry, we love to complain, we love to criticize when we've been corrected, but do you seek the Lord's counsel? Many of us watch this jump to conclusions when folk correct us. And the more wiser approach to this thing, I remember when I just thought I was so wise in God, and I'm just about some 20, 20 year old, what, what they still say, wet behind the ears. And I got some seasoned folk trying to tell me some things concerning ministry, but I think I just got this relationship with God. But the, the smarter thing to do should have been, Lord, let me seek your counsel. Yeah. Yeah. This correction does not feel good. I've been doing it this way, watch this, somebody say my whole life. My whole life. So all of a sudden, God is now saying that my life has been out of order, but I've been doing it. I, I saw mama do it. Yeah. I saw big mama do it. So what I, the wiser thing should be to do is, God, let me seek your counsel concerning you. It's contrary to all that I've known, contrary to everything that I've used to adapt to life and navigate through life. And the wiser thing is to do, somebody say, seek his counsel. And watch this. Why is this significant? Because your comfort and order will come when you seek his counsel. Because hear this, the reason why many cry, complain, or criticize at God's command for order is because order is hard when it's contrary to what we've always done. It's a hard thing. So God says, before, if you want some level of comfort to do a hard thing, you've got to seek my counsel. What do I mean? For many of us, peace, pursuing peace is a hard thing when I've always just cut people off. That's a hard thing when all I've known... My mom, mama said cutting them folk off. But the Bible says pursue peace. And then the Bible says with all that's within you, pursue peace. So now, God, you saying I've been out of order because I done cut some folk off. The pastor told me to cut folk off. That ain't good for my life. But God says we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. So I've got to seek counsel when all I've known is to cut folk off. Tell your neighbor, don't cut folk off. Seek counsel. Reconciling can be hard. Watch this. When all I've just done is cuss folk out. God, I got to seek your counsel. And watch this. Trusting people is hard. When I've always just covered up my real feelings from people. I'll never, the Bible says it's not good that man be alone. The Bible says don't forsake ourselves from the assembling of folk. And then all I've done was really be a, 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 a shadow of myself. A, a figment of myself and I've never opened myself up to real relationships so God says if you want to do the hard thing you've got to seek my counsel tell your neighbor if you want to do the hard thing seek my counsel in other words we can have hope in the hard thing that the Lord asks us to do when we receive his counsel notice what Psalm 33 11 says the Bible says that the counsel of the Lord stands forever and the plans of his heart to all generations. Because if his counsel stands, it's sure. Therefore, if you need hope in the hard thing, then somebody say, seek his face. Seek his face. So watch this. Maybe the reason that order has been so difficult in your life is because you failed to obtain counsel from the God of order. The reason why it seems like it's so hard to get the right circle in my life. It's so hard to create a prayer life for myself. It's so hard for me to walk in consistency with God's word is because watch this, we're doing it by our own means, our own thought process, our own ideologies. And God said, if you just seek my face, watch, watch this, I'll give you hope in a hard thing. And watch this, this walk in God, somebody say, it's hard. So I need God to count for me. Listen, y'all, I know I look like I've been saved for a few years, but tell your neighbor, the pastor used to cuss. The pastor used to cuss. And if I'm not with God, if I'm not seeking God, I'll cuss y'all now. I'm serious, y'all, we act so deep. 
All right, this pastor used to holler at somebody say a whole bunch of girls. If I did not seek the counsel of God, I would not know how to be a good husband to my wife. Somebody say it's a hard thing. And watch this, I said this, I told, I don't know if I said this just to my wife, but as long as I'm wrapped in this flesh down here, everything that the God, God asked me to do will be a hard thing. I know a lot of preachers like to preach like this is so easy. We like to exhort like this thing is so easy. But as long as you're wrapped in flesh, somebody say it's a hard thing. So this is why, this is why pastors find themselves falling. They know how to quote scripture about God, but they don't know how to seek God for themselves. So if I want to make sure I have the ability to do a hard thing, tell your neighbor you got to seek God. This is why Sunday mornings cannot be your only time that you hear about God, find yourself in God's word. Because tell your neighbor, next week going to be hard. All right, next week going to be hard. Y'all going to want to cut somebody out after you leave here. And this is why we must be taught to seek his counsel. And I need y'all to notice something about this text. Notice how Hezekiah seeks God's counsel. The Bible says that he turned his face toward the wall. Somebody say void of distractions. And then the Bible says he prayed to the Lord. Somebody say depended upon his voice. And why is this significant? Because the counsel of others, and I've said this before, is safe, but only God's counsel is sovereign. God, the, count, the Bible says that in a multitude of counselors, there's safety. But you can get safe counsel and that counsel not be sovereign. What am I trying to say? God's voice has to be the final say. And I'm going to say this, and y'all better make sure Pastor Keith never say this. Y'all know how a lot of pastors will say, y'all don't do nothing without coming to your pastor first. Don't, no, don't make sure that you, because I'm going to hear God before you do. Somebody say, the devil is a lie. His voice may be safe, but it's not sovereign. And we've got too many pastors trying to put themselves in the place of God. Hezekiah never went to the prophet who came to him. The Bible says he turned his face to the wall. And then he said that I sought the Lord. I'm not, I know the prophet gave me a word, but you better turn your face to the wall. God's voice is, his counsel is sovereign. Some, somebody say his counsel is sovereign. In other words, the Lord wants us to teach us that order comes from him and him alone. And if they're not providing you, watch his counsel from the word of God and in the will of God, then it's not sovereign. So hear this. If you can't trust their word, watch this, then wait on his word. Did y'all hear what I just said? If you can't trust their word, you better wait on his word, baby. I know my wife loves me. I trust her word. But watch this. I'm still going to wait on his word. Because I can make a decision, watch this, that's going to have generational consequences. Because I trusted the word of my wife and I did not wait on his word. Oh, tell your neighbor, wait on his word. I need to wait on his word. Uh, why does the Lord want us to teach us to receive his counsel? Because watch this. Yeah, somebody may say, I get all of that, Pastor Keith, that's good, I like all of that. But why, why? Because consistently seeking the God of order will cause us to consistently know the order of God. Did y'all hear what I just said? If I consistently seek the God of order, I will consistently know the order of God. I ain't got to go to no prophet. I ain't got to sow no another seed. I ain't got to have all these multiple counseling sessions with my pastor. And many pastors just need to tell folk, go seek God yourself. I'm trying to, I'm trying to get vision, y'all. Go see God yourself. And we've got so many people that do not know the order of God because they have not been seeking the God of order. Tell your neighbor, seek the God of order. Oh, so God is saying, this is why, watch what David says in Psalm 27, 4. And I'm out your way, y'all. The Bible says, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. Somebody say, all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Not to inquire of the, the, the prophet, the priest, but to inquire in his temple. Because when you continually dwell in the house of the Lord, watch this, you will continually have example for your house. Did y'all hear what I just said? The reason why some of our houses are out of order, because we don't have God's perfect example. 
And God says, if you can dwell in my house, I'm not talking about the physical structure. Because y'all don't even like to come to church. I'm talking about, somebody say his house. So God is saying, can you get what, what John said that I was in the third heaven? I, I, when, he, when he got all those revelations on the island of Patmos, I want to be with God like that. Because sometimes, you know, folk can distract you from getting to God. This is why grandmas them had the prayer closet where they can dwell in somebody say his house. This was just the church, this physical building was just supposed to be a place to tell us how to get to his house. And many pastors will make you say, you got to be in church, you got to be in church. But I only want you in church so you can learn how to get to his house. Be weary of pastors that always want you in the physical house and never tell you how to get to his house. Because if I get to his house, see, watch this, we all jacked up in here. So even though it looks like Pastor Keith and, and Minister Serena have a godly example of marriage, Tell your neighbor there's some disorder in their marriage. See, y'all don't like that. But if I can get to his house, I can see the example that God wants me to see. I can see that I'm supposed to love him like Christ loved the church. We've got to somebody say, get to his house. Oh, Jesus, help us get to your house. In other words, the Lord wants to teach us something through order. And this is why there's a doctrine of order. And this is why order teaches us to seek his counsel. Watch this. When God leads us into order, he always wants us to learn something. He's not just going to say, set your house in order because I want to preserve you. I want to give you the promises of God. Tell you, neighbor, he wants us to learn something. Because God does not demand a thing from a believer without it accompanying his doctrine. So here's a good litmus test. If you think you've heard from God and God don't ever give you a word, somebody say that's in the book. To so go with it, it's probably not God. Because whenever God puts a demand on the life of a believer, he always backs it up with his word. And why, do, why does he back it up with his word? Y'all know that when you sign a lease, sometimes they'll make you have a guarantor. His word is the guarantor. Because the Bible says that his word stands forever. The, the grass may wither and the flowers may fade, but my word stands forever. So God says, even uh, the, 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 this world may pass away, but my word will not. So God, whenever God puts a demand on our life, you said he told you to marry her, God going to send a word with it. If God told you to start a church, this is why when churches don't have foundational scriptures to back what they're doing, tell your neighbor that's them and not God. God will always accompany a demand with his doctrine because his word is his guarantor. Right? It's going to let me know that this is what God is trying to, to, to teach me. Tell, tell you, neighbor, he's trying to teach me something. So I need to know that it's always going to accompany his doctrine. In other words, the Lord wants to see, teach us something through order. And this is why there's a doctrine of order. Somebody may be saying, why is this significant? Because when we know that God is trying to teach us something through order, then setting order won't seem as trying. Did y'all hear what I just said? When I know that this process is not in vain, it won't be as trying. Because when God tells me to do something contrary to what I've always been doing, I said this before, it's a hard thing. But when I know that I'm going to learn something after the fact, that I'm going to be better as a result of what God is taking me through. That, 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 that I'm going to come out as pure gold. It's going to make what seems trying not so hard. Because I know that God is trying to teach me something as a result. And watch this. How many of us have been in situations and we ain't learned nothing? We went through stuff and we wondered, why did I go through that? Because I ain't even learned nothing from that. Because watch this, many times God had already tried to teach you a lesson over here. But because you never learned from it, you had to go through that thing again. Somebody say, again. So it, it makes what setting my house in order not as trying. And although difficult, I believe Hezekiah learned what the Lord was trying to teach him by way of order. He learned order comes to correct. That order comes with consequences. And that order comes to produce counsel. And if we want to set our houses in order, we must learn likewise. But even more, I think there's a greater lesson found in our text. Notice what happened after Hezekiah's correction. 
He has revealed the consequences. And after he seeks the Lord's counsel, our foundational text says this in a lot of part of verse number three. The Bible says, and Hezekiah wept bitterly. In other words, what we learn from order should convict us. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, it should convict me. Somebody may be saying, why is this significant? Because 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 reminds us, for godly sorrow produces repentance. In other words, repentance is, somebody say, is to turn the other way. Yeah. So whenever we see this word repentance, it's really saying, I'm going to turn the other way. I'm, all that stuff that I used to do, I'm no longer going to do. So what this, all this teaching should do is convict me to conform to the order of God. And the reason why many of our lives are still out of order is because many of us are not convicted. We know what we're doing is wrong. We know what this, this is out of order from God. But somebody say, I don't want to learn the lesson, I like it. Somebody say, I don't want to learn the lesson, I like it. Y'all like it, y'all like the disorder. You still like to go to the club. You still like to do all of that. But you know what, I heard a bishop say this and I think this is critical. It's not that I don't like it anymore, it's just not available. I just need it not to be available. I, it's not that I don't like women anymore, they're just not available. Y'all see, y'all don't like that. So my repentance, what repentance does is turn me the other way. So stuff is not available. I'm gonna give y'all something and y'all like, gonna think this ain't deep enough for y'all. But because I'm still wrapped in flesh and because I'm a man, that does not mean that my wife is the only fine woman in the world. So what I have to do is turn my eyes when I see stuff that is tempting. Somebody say, I repent. I make it not available. So we need God to cause a level of conviction that I know, God, this is not of your order. So I turn my face. So not... Because watch this, the enemy knows what we like. He's going to make situations to present what we like. But we've got to be convicted in such a way that we make it not available. Can, can, can you learn from the order of God that you can be in a place where you're convicted? I know I want to cuss them out. It's been plenty of time driving down the road. I wanted to cuss some folk out. But because I was convicted by the order of God, I was able to turn the other cheek. Y'all need to do a study on when you see that word turn. It's not that it's not there anymore. They, they still there. They still, that God, they right there. You know I got it. <laughs> but I've got to, I got to turn, y'all. <laughs> Tell you, neighbor, you got to turn. Oh, Lord, we got to turn. I want godly sorrow to produce repentance. Because if we want to conform to the order of God, we've got to turn. Yeah. And hear this, I want to say this, and I'm going to be out your way, and I'm going to pray. Notice what our foundational text says in verses 4 and 6. The Bible says, And the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, saying, Go and tell Hezekiah, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your tears. Surely I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand and the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city. God is only moved by the order in your life when you are convicted. Did y'all hear what I just said? God is only moved by the order in your life when we're convicted. So if we want God to be compelled with our efforts, y'all know how a lot of folks say I'm doing things for God, I'm doing all of this for God, and we wonder why God ain't moved? Because God ain't gonna never be moved if you're not doing these things because you've been convicted. Many of us do it because we've seen somebody else do it. We've seen somebody else get blessed this way. We think this is the right way to do it. Oh, this is how I'm going to maneuver and manipulate God to get the blessings of the Lord to be opened up in my life. And God said, I ain't compelled by that until you find yourself convicted. And it was not until Hezekiah was convicted that God says immediately all these things. That I've heard your prayer, that I've seen your tears. How many times have we prayed and God not moved? Maybe you didn't do it because you were convicted, but you tried to manipulate God to move on your behalf. And God says, immediately this happened. I want God to be compelled by everything I do by, for him. But the only way is if we learn the lesson. God says, if you set your house in order, if you can be convic convicted by what I teach you, 
that I'll be compelled to move. That's good news to me. Let us stand to our feet. Father, we bless you. I want you to get on your mind every area in your life that is out of order. Everything that you're doing that you know is contrary to God and his word. God, we ask you to set our houses in order. Help us to set our houses in order. God, we don't want to put in the effort, the energy. We don't want to extend the emotional resources and God, you not be compelled. Convict us, God, by all that we learn. God, we thank you, God, that you've, you've come by way of order to correct us. I pray for every heart in this place. God, that they'll receive rebuke. God, from where, if it comes from the right person who brings a word with it, let us receive the rebuke. It can come from our little baby who's only three years old. But God, if they come with a word, we'll receive our correction. God, we're not too high. We won't let titles and positions allow us not to be in a position to be rebuked. I don't care if you the head of your house or the man of your house. If your wife comes with a word to correct you, I pray, God, that they move in a, a, a position of humility, that they receive the rebuke. God, not reject it so that we can be eligible to set our houses in order. And God, when we don't learn by way of correction, God, many of us will have to learn the hard way. I pray for mercy against the hard way. God, give them another level of grace so we don't have to learn the hard way. God, we want every promise of our life to be yes and amen. Let us not negate any promises because we fail to adhere to your correction. But there's consequences, God. We know that. We'll learn it, God, before we experience it. And God, help us, God, to seek your counsel. I pray for every believer in this place, God, that they learn how to get to your house. We've been in this physical house, God, but we need to know how to get to your house. God, our mama had a good example, God, but it's nothing like your house. God, our pastor had a good example, God, but it's nothing like your house. God, help us to get to your house, we pray. Because if we can consistently seek your, your house, the God of order, we'll have an example of how to set our houses in order. And God, we thank you, God, that we'll be convicted. God, we're not saying that it's not hard. God, we're not even saying, God, we, that we don't like it, but it's simply not available anymore. God, help us to turn the other way. I pray a turning in the spirit, God. Every heart and heart that wants to cut some folk out. Every heart and heart, God, that wants to cut some folk off. God, help us to simply turn the other way so that we can be an example of the order of God. And God, I pray, God, now that we've turned the other way, now that we've been convicted, you're compelled to move. And somebody say this, and I'm a, I want you to say it prophetically, say immediately, God, you're compelled to move. God, there's some areas in, your life, in their lives, God, that they need you to move immediately. And the only hold up, God, from you moving immediately is that we failed to be convicted. I pray, God, that your people are convicted now so that you might be compelled to move. And every heart that says, I'm going to learn my lesson and I ain't going to learn it the hard way, say thank God and amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. Hey, Pastor Cole, if you don't mind coming up here now, I want us to do a call to salvation and I also want to extend the doors of the church um, to somebody who wants to co come in covenant with us, but I, somebody say the pastor got to change his shirt. And the pastor got to change his shirt. I got some other stuff to do before we benedict, so I want to go change and I'm going to have Pastor Cole take us further in service. Praise the Lord, of course, for that word. Um, and let's not take this moment lightly um, for all those that may be in the house and Yes, there's a lot of things that we could assume. And if you were listening at all to the message, just because you were walking in the ways of your mother, your grandmother, your grandfather, that doesn't mean salvation. Big mama can't get you into heaven. She doesn't hold the key to the gate. Guess what? Your pastor doesn't even do that. But this church was founded on that scripture. And Jesus said it like this. He said, I am the way. 
I am the truth and I'm the life. And no one can come to the Father but through me. So in a moment like this, this is your opportunity to come and say, you know what? I, I see that I'm in need of a Savior. And I desire this place they call heaven. And I don't know everything about it, but I desire it. But there's only one way to get to it according to scripture, which is to accept the Lord and Savior Jesus. So on today, even right now, it's simple. It's simple as this. Admitting that you need a Savior. That's, that, that's where it starts at. We can't do it by ourselves. Admitting it. And then you not only can admit it, now you have to believe that that Lord and Savior, that one way is through Jesus Christ. And then you need to also, you got to believe it in your heart and then confess it with your mouth. And if you've never done that, you've never done that. Maybe you've done one. Maybe you've done the third one. But it takes all three. It takes all three. And maybe that's you and you've never done that on today. Well, guess what? This is the opportunity put in this service just for you. Just for you. And so, you know what? This, this is a personal thing. And so, yes, the old church, yes, we might have had everybody run up and everybody tap on the shoulder. But remember, this is a heart confession. This is from you. So as every head is bowed and eyes closed, if that's you on today and you need to admit that you need a savior, you need to believe that it's the Lord Jesus. You need to confess with your mouth. And you want to do that on today. Just raise your hand up. Because the only thing I want to do with you is to pray with you. And if that's someone that's online and you need to do that on today, put that in the comment box. We want to get in contact with you on today. And maybe that's not your call for today. But guess what? We also have a person in the name of... Keith Walter Babb that wants to shepherd you into the place where God wants you to be. Where rebuke doesn't become a bad word. Where correction is something that we're used to. That we don't have to look for those consequences. He can lead you into those places. Even on today. Is that you? Are you looking for a shepherd? Are you looking for a church home? And if so, you could just rip, raise up your hand. We want to just join with you. We want to be in covenant with you on today. I know we had one on last week, but if that's you also in the, in the online, we have covenant partnerships that are not even in this state. So we thank God for every single person. And if that's not you, we thank God for every person that does know who Jesus is on today. And maybe this is what I want you to do. Get someone on your mind and in your heart right now that you need to tell Jesus about. That family member that friend, that co-worker. Let's not be selfish with this. We we'll share Christ on this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Is Pastor Keith is coming back? Nope, actually, Minister Serena is coming back up. Pastor Keith is coming also. We want to celebrate some people on this morning. Amen. Okay, really quickly, y'all, we won't be before you long, but what we want to do is um, acknowledge some graduates. We have some 2021 graduates that we want to acknowledge. Amen. And how many of you know, if you've been to any kind of school, it, it takes, I always tell people, because I work on a college campus and I worked at USF for 10 and a half years, that... It, the smartest people don't graduate, but the ones that are the most determined and committed, right? Um, I, I've seen some people graduate where I'm like, my God, I don't know how they made it. 
but tenacity will get you a long way. And so uh, we're so proud of all of you who have graduated, um, sent your information in. If you didn't send your information in and we don't acknowledge you, even if you're online and you're watching, still do that because we would love to acknowledge you. We're so proud of you. Um, education is important. Um, it is the key to a lot of things in this life that we live. So we're so very proud of these names. Very first. All right, I got it. We want to call up my little godson. Listen to this name, y'all. It's something in a name. Britton Cody Leon Cole Jr. He is graduating from BPK. You want to stand up? He is so humble. We got. We know how to pray. Cody wants to be a game creator. And listen, we got enough preachers. Somebody go create some games. So y'all give it up for our future IT major. Okay. Pastor Keith said let him stay right there. Oh, come down now. Oh, Pastor Keith. And his tight kids at the way shirt. He fully vaccinated. He wanted y'all to know. <laughs> Amen. And then our next graduate, graduating from kindergarten at Summerfield Crossings, is Annabella, we know her as Bella, Pari. Come on, Bella. I know you're not shy. She having a moment. <laughs> Bella and all of that personality. <laughs> Y'all give Bella another hand clap of praise. Did she get her certificate? Hey Amen. They don't even know they got a long way to go. <laughs> and next we have Kathleen Wilson, who is graduating from middle school at Summerfield Crossings. Ready to go to high school, Kathleen. Oh, I'm sorry. Nope, she corrected me. You're right, Kathleen. I'm sorry. She's going to middle school. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was trying to push you in high school. Almost, Kathleen. Almost. Amen. And then next we have one of our twins, Jaden Dunning, who is graduating from high school at Tampa Bay Christian Academy. Amen. And Jaden is attending our alma mater, USF. Go Bulls. <laughs> oh, and Pastor Cole wants you to know he, you, he was um, his preschool teacher, which means Pastor Cole is old. That's what that means. <laughs> wow. His first teacher. Oh, he said he, okay. He taller than the pastor. And then next uh, part of this dynamic duo is Braden Dunny, who also graduated high school from Tampa Bay Christian Academy. And Braden will be starting welding school in August. Amen. Woo! I'm assuming you was also his preschool teacher. Okay twice as old. Hey man, boys, I'm so proud of you. You know how many people don't make it through high school? Is LD here? If not, we're going to acknowledge you anyway, LD, because you may be watching online. And then next we have Lazard. We know him as L.D. Dennis, and he is graduating from the University of South Florida with an MBA in sports. Amen. He will be graduating with an MBA in sports business 
and an MS dual um, major in sports entertainment and management and he desires to be an athletic director at HBCU amen so we're praying that God will open doors for you LD um, if you all see him he pops in sometime he's quiet he comes and he serves and he leaves but I'm so proud of you also a bull so congratulations and then lastly you all may have seen this online LD come see the pastor he has your gift card okay don't see me see your pastor has something for you from the way church family and then lastly but definitely not least you may have seen this online we are so proud of her but let us give um, some hand claps of praise to Sharla Walker listen to this you always save the highest degree for last who graduated with her doctorate of nursing practice degree so let me introduce her to her way family again this is Dr. Sharla Walker who is super, super smart. <laughs> and I believe, Charlotte, correct me if I'm wrong, you will be getting your own practice now, right? Starting soon, her own practice. Amen. Charlotte, we're so proud of you. Amen. Amen. Can we give them another hand clap of praise? Any of you desiring to, to go to school or do what you have to do, hang in there, continue to do it. Um, I'm going to say this because we were just talking about her the other day. It's never too late. It's never too late to return to school. If God has placed that on your heart and that's the direction God has given you, then be active in that. And as someone who's worked in financial aid for 10 plus years, there is money out there. They are now, something recently got passed, they are getting ready to double the Pell Grant over the next few years. If you don't know, that's about another $6,000 a sum. Uh, per year so that would take it to about twelve thousand dollars we were talking about my mom my mom did what any good mom would do put her school dreams on hold got her kids into school and went back and graduated magna cum laude went back amen oh mom raise your hand so they know <laughs> that's my mom so it's never too late. She went back years. I know people who graduate with me and could, could barely get through and she went back. So when it's your time, it's your time and God will grace you and he will bless you. So, um, so whatever you have and he's laid on your heart, pursue that wholeheartedly. Amen. So also we want to uh, make sure you please stay. Just a few announcements. Continued prayers. Ephesians 5 and 16 admonishes us to pray for one another. So let us continue to pray for those on our prayer list. Um, let's continue to make intercession until God intervenes. Minister Denshell read the names earlier. We have Sister Pinkney. Uh, we have um, Sister Sharon West. Um, just all of those families and names that we've been lifting up. Let's continue to pray. Okay. Continue to pray. Don't just let us hear it. But when you go home, even if you can't remember the names, God, for those who um, had the courage to put their name on the prayer list we, we pray that you would do something for them so let's continue to pray for one another um, July altar call so join us tomorrow at 7 p.m. for our monthly prayer line altar call the details to join us will be sent via text email and posted on our social media platforms and we pray as the spirit leads and lay and we will pray, I'm sorry, as the spirit leads and lay all on the altar so every month we have these month, um, prayer calls because of the time frame, I haven't been able to get on many of them, but I heard they have been a blessing. So we want to encourage you. Um, yes, please be on them as much as possible. So the July one will be tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, our new midweek ser um, series, join us every Thursday via Facebook Live in June and July at 7 p.m. as we continue our midweek ser um, series entitled Summer Diet, a study on the fruit of the spirit summer diet a study on the fruit of the spirit has that been blessing you all we've had different teachers come up they've been teaching amen you can also um, view those on facebook if you haven't had a chance to or via youtube the power of the spirit in our lives is made evident by the presence of fruit in our lives so make plans to join us weekly as we go on a spiritual summer diet um 
Lastly, follow us. We have made strategic efforts to recently improve our communication platforms to share our messages and means to connect with others. So we need you to follow us. So please, please, please find us and follow us and subscribe to us on Facebook, subscribe on Instagram, subscribe on YouTube so that you can stay connected and up to date with all that we're doing at The Way Church. Communication is key and there are a number of platforms. So we're trying to put as much out there, not to inundate you, but to ensure that you have um, every mean in which you use to connect with us. Sure. Pastor Keith and I need an earpiece so that he can give me little messages when I'm up here talking. Uh, set your house in order. Join us in person or via Facebook Live next week Sunday as Pastor Keith will culminate our current sermon series, Setting Your House in Order. Setting Your House in Order. Much of what the Lord has ordained for our lives has not been fulfilled because our lives are void, in or void of order. So come learn how to set your house in order. It's a blessing to see a packed house um, today fairly as we come back. Um, I know we've taken quite a number of seats out, but if you can't join us, if you're watching online and you can't join us here we completely understand that's okay but still tune in on those platforms that we just discussed because we don't want you to miss this um the, the ending of this sermon series amen um lastly i just want to acknowledge any visitors you can just throw your hands up we're not gonna do like the old church make you come up and say give an honor to god and where you go to church just throw your hands up visit amen thank y'all thank you so much listen thank you for worshiping with us Thank you. I know Brandon, we're going to put you on blast. Brandon family is here. Can y'all raise your hand? We love Brandon. His sister, his mommy. Am I allowed to announce the other person? That's your business. In the words of Tabitha Brown, that's your business. I ain't going to say nothing. My husband said, don't be messy. Apparently, I still need to be set in order. All right. So um, thank y'all so much. Listen, visitors, can you please see who should they see in the back? Because we have a gift for you. Um, someone. Oh, Miss Nicole, I'm sorry. Your hand is right up. Please see Miss Nicole. Lift it one more time, Miss Nicole, just in case they miss on this side. They did. Oh, he wants the visitors to lift your hands one more time so Miss Nicole can see your faces. Just in case you try to slip out, she can chase you down the street uh, and give you this gift that Pastor Keith has prepared. Can we stand to our feet? Let's go ahead and Benedict. Did you all enjoy service today? Amen. Oh, Lord, have a seat. Thank you, Mama. My mama's still correcting me. Have a seat. <laughs> Pastor Keith said at the beginning of his sermon, you ain't never too old to be corrected, right? I'm 34, and I still have to get corrected. Uh, I forget the offering every time I'm up here. Every time. We need the offering. We need the lights on. We need the microphones working. Uh, but listen, here at The Way Church, we try to encourage you to give what God has laid on your heart to give. Uh, we shy away from giving amounts. No, $100 is not, God is not going to bless $100 over, over $10. He's going to bless the heart that gave it and wanted to give, regardless of the amount. So right now, um, I believe it is it up on the screen. Those are come, some, some of the ways that you can give. Should we get a basket in case someone... Um, do you want them to see you in the back, Mr. Rick? Okay. Uh, Mr. Rick is in the back. He has a basket. If we have envelopes in the seat facing you behind, if you look in the back of the seat, um, if you don't know the person in front of you, don't be touching them on the shoulder. Just dig in the back. You can grab an offering envelope. If you need one, if you need one. And if, and if there's not one there, slip up your hand. Someone will make sure you get it. Um, but you, of course, you can give in person. And then we have the ways listed here. You can give via Cash App um, at Dollar Sign Away Church of TB. Those of you watching online should also see this in the comments or see this information. You can give via PayPal through our website. And for those, uh, we do have a few people who like to mail their offering. That email, um, I'm sorry, mailing address is listed there. Give what God has laid on your heart. But give consistently, not grudgingly and under compulsion. That's what the Bible teaches us. We want to teach stewardship. We want to teach listening to God, not listening to man. Amen. You can put it back up, Charla, just because we have visitors. And I'll close out on that, so it's fine. Um, I don't want to take up time waiting, you all, but you'll have the information there. Okay, now we can stand if you are ready to Benedict. I was glad when they said unto me, let us come into the house of the Lord. 
I don't know about you, but sometimes I come kicking. I live with the pastor, and so unfortunately, he gets to see all my rawness. Even if I wake up and say, I don't feel like going today, he has to hear it. But most days, I, I'm, I'm glad that we have an opportunity to be in the house of the Lord. I'm glad to see your faces. I've missed so many of you, so it's good to put our arms around you and love on you. <clears throat> Amen. Let us go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this service today. We thank you for everything that was said. We pray that it was pleasing to your ears. We pray that when you look down on us, that it made your heart glad. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that uh, you come to correct us. Your word says that those whom you love, you chastise. And so we thank you for that, God. Any rebuking, any setting in order, any correction, all of it is because you love us. You love us so much. And like a good parent, you don't allow us to just live reckless lives. And we thank you for that. Even when our emotions tell us otherwise, we still thank you and we value that and we appreciate it. God, as Pastor Keith prepares for this culminating message next Sunday, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will speak to him all throughout the week. And while he is hearing from you for the last word of this sermon series, we pray that we're continuing to digest this word throughout the week and living it um, and really seeking you concerning those things that you're trying to set in order. God, be with us and cover us. Thank you for these graduates. Thank you for these, the younger ones who parents continue to push them and encourage them. Thank you even for Tamikia and Willie who got to see their babies now walk across that stage. We thank you, God, that it was all worth it. We thank you for those days that no one probably even knew about, oh God. We thank you for that. We celebrate all of them. And may you bless them in their future endeavors, oh God. We love you and we praise you. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in online. You all have a great rest of your Sunday holiday weekend. Enjoy and be safe.